بسم الله والحمد لله ثم الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كل وكف بالله شهيد والسلام وبارك على نبي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عما بعد I got a question for all of you in here today. How many of you believe the statement Muhammad Rasulullah? Raise your hand. Good. How many of you try every day to implement the sunnah or the traditions, the sayings, the statements and the actions of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Raise your hands. Good, because we're going to talk about sunnah today. Because <clears throat> the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is not just restricted to how he brushed his teeth. It's not just restricted to the way he dressed, the way he ate, the way he slept. These are all part and parcel to the sunnah. But if you don't understand the spirit of the entire sunnah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, <clears throat> you are just repeating this information. You're not getting the whole point. What we will talk about today insha'Allah ta'ala is the point of the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And I'm going to take you through a small journey through the seerah. How many of you have ever read any seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam about his life? Raise your hands. Whether it's Ar-Rahik al-Makhtoom, the life of Muhammad, Hayat al-Muhammad, whatever. Khair. I'm going to tell you today five things. Four or five depending on my time frame. Probably going to run over just a little bit. Four or five things about the sunnah and the seerah that if you learn these five things today, you will walk out of here better than you came into this place. And that's what we want, insha'Allah. Now, how many of you have children? Raise your hand. I, I need to get you to think. I gotta get you to think. Okay, good. Children do something, a puzzle in school, or they do it in coloring books called to connect the dots. How many of you have ever seen a connect the dot puzzle? Raise your hand again. Connect the dots. What is connect the dots? It's a picture that is made out of numbered dots. And in order to find out what the picture is, you need to connect those dots, correct? You need to start at one, and then you need to go to the end, right? What happens if I take that picture and I go out of order. I go from 1 to 7 to 4 to 3 to 12 to 16 and I connect them like that. What will happen? Shout it out. Go ahead. You have free reign to shout. Chaos. Chaos. It would not be what is supposed to be represented. It would be a mess. You might draw another picture or you might draw something that's just a big mess. Correct? <clears throat> now what happens if you say, you know what, I'm not going to connect those dots whatsoever. Just leave it how it is. Would you know what that picture represents? No, you wouldn't really know what the picture represents if it's a good connect the dot puzzle. You see, with the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, and the sunnah, this is what we do. We connect the dots improperly, which represents Islam distorted to the world through our lives. We misrepresent Islam with our distorted, misdirected connect the dot puzzle or or we don't connect any of those dots and we just say, Masha Allah, leave it where it is. And nobody knows what Islam is, nor you, nor them. This is our problem, wallahi. When it comes to the seerah and the sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu So I'm going to give you five dots today that will paint a beautiful picture. And you may say, how the heck are you going to paint a picture with five dots? Just watch. Let's start, and I'm going to have to speed through because this is very short time frame to get all of this. Let's start at the beginning. When the Prophet ﷺ was at the age of 40 years, he retired himself to a cave in a mountain known as Ghar al-Hira, or Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light, the cave of Hira in Mecca. And he would go there and fast and think and look at his people. From Ghar al-Hira, you can see the entire town of Mecca. Well, you used to be able to see the entire town of Mecca. Now with all the high-rise buildings, you don't see much. But you used to be able to see the entire town of Mecca and you could see the Kaaba from that place. And he would contemplate the problems of his people. The, the, the problems you've heard 
throughout these lectures of how the Arabs had no respect for women, for children, for right, for justice. He would worry about his people. One day, and this is according to his own statements, one day as he was sitting in that cave, he said, a man appeared in this cave. A figure appeared in this cave and he made light shine throughout this cave. And this is not a big cave, it's only really big enough to sit in. So a man came in the cave and only had one statement to him. What was this statement? Iqra. Read. Recite. The Prophet ﷺ said, I don't know how. He couldn't read. He didn't know what to recite. Or someone said to you, recite. And I said, recite what? He said, I don't know. So this angel or this figure squeezed him and said again, Iqra. He said, I just told you I don't know how. Squeezed, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not giving it to you verbatim. No, this is a story. He squeezed them again and said, Iqara, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalaqa. Read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a congealed drop of blood. Read in your Lord is most bounteous. He taught that to man by the pen that which he did not know. Beautiful, weighty statement. And then this figure introduced himself. He said, My name is Jibreel or Gabriel, and I am the messenger from your Lord to the messengers of your Lord. Then Jibreel, peace be upon him, introduced Muhammad to his Rabb, his Lord. He said, Your Lord is Allah, who created you to worship Him alone with Tawheed, with oneness. Then Jibreel alayhi salam introduced Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to himself. He said, and you, O Muhammad, have been chosen by Allah to be his last and final messenger to humanity. And then what happened? Jibreel just disappeared. Those three statements telling him who he was, who Allah was, and introducing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to himself, Jibreel just left. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, started to wonder what had just happened. I mean, this is a scene where he's wondering, wait a minute, hold on a second, have I starved myself to death here? Am I going nuts? Did I see what I just saw? So his first thought, <laughs> his first thought was about whom? To go home to his beloved wife Khadija radiallahu anha. The woman whom he loved so much, that he made Aisha radiallahu anha jealous of her and she had never met her and she was already dead. He went home to his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. But on the way home, Jibreel appeared again, but this time he was standing across the sky. And he reminded the Prophet والسلام, I am Jibreel and you are indeed the messenger of Allah. Have no doubt about what you just saw. It's real. So he went home to Khadija radiallahu anha. May Allah Azza wa Jal be pleased with her and grant her the highest ranks in Jannah. He went home to her and told her this story of what just happened to him and asked his wife, Am I, am I losing it? She radiallahu anha wa radaha said, You are a man whom Allah would never disgrace with madness. You speak the truth. You help the needy. You stand up for justice. You are Sadiq al Amin, the truthful and the honest one. Allah would not disgrace you with madness. So not only did she console, consort, and support her husband, but she became the first to affirm La ilaha illallah, Muhammad al Rasulullah. She became the first person to embrace this beautiful deen out of women, if you want to be specific. And then Ali out of children, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu from the men. Now, after this initial revelation, Khadija radiallahu anha wanted to go and talk to someone. She had a relative named Waraqa bin Nawfal radiallahu anhu, who had read the Torah, revealed to Musa as it was in that time, what was left. He had read the Injil or what was left of it at that time. So he knew the former revelations of Allah and was in tune with some of the scriptures of Allah. So she went to him and told him what happened to her husband. And what did Waraqa say? 
He was blind at that time and was very old. He stood up and he said, Wallahi, by Allah who holds my soul in his hands, your husband has been visited by the same angel that came to Musa, the same angel that came to Isa. He's been chosen by Allah to be the messenger to his, to his people and I have read about him in the former revelations. Then Waraka met the Prophet ﷺ a short time later and he told him some auspicious news. Waraka said, I wish that I was a young man. I wish I was a young man so that I could stand beside you and support you when your people throw you out. Now you have to understand the culture and the asabiya of the pre-Islamic Arabs. Unfortunately, it still prevails today in many of our Muslim worlds. They would support one another even in blatant wrong if it was family involved. You supported family till the death even if you know what they're doing is wrong. You never sell out the family. So the Prophet ﷺ said, are my people going to throw me out for this one statement? Warqa said, have no doubt about this. No one came with what you are going to come with, except their people were the first to throw them out. Should be some consort and some comfort to us, especially as reverts. Your people will be the first to throw you out and have guarantee about this. So the Prophet ﷺ got some ominous news. Then, the Prophet ﷺ said, after that, the revelation stopped. Because what he was just given, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaqa, was the first few verses of what would become known as the Qur'an. The huge weight upon his shoulders was just sitting there. A weight that Allah said, had he revealed this Qur'an into a mountain, you would have seen the mountain humble itself out of khashya and fear of Allah. And he said, no more revelations came. Jibreel didn't come. Nothing happened. So much time passed that he became worried again. And so he decided to go walk in the desert and clear his mind. As he was walking in the desert, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Jibreel all of a sudden appeared in the sky again and said, I am Jibreel and you are indeed the messenger of Allah. So much so the Prophet said Jibreel frightened him that time because the way he came and how forceful he was. So the Prophet والسلام, ran home to his wife Khadija again, radiallahu anha. And he told her what? Dhamiluni. Cover me up, wrap me up, cover me up. And he was sitting under a blanket. And then another verse was revealed to him and the beginning of an entire surah. Does anyone know the next verse to be revealed after Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaqa in those few verses? Ya ayyuhal mudathir O you who is wrapped up in the mantle Qum, get up, fa'andir and go warn your people wa rabbaka fa kabir and magnify your Lord and purify your garments and stay away from the idols. You see, brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ did not have a lot at this time. The Quran was just initiated to be revealed. He had a handful of verses. He knew who Allah was. He knew who Jibreel was. He knew who he was. But Allah is telling him, there is no more time for sitting around. Get up. Get up, the first imperative command to move. Get up and go warn people about me. Tell them that a day is going to come where they're going to stand before me. And I'm going to account for them for what they've done in this life. And those who obey me, I can forgive them and give them Jannah. And those who disobey me, I will punish them with hell. This is the reality of our deen, don't play with it. So the Prophet ﷺ did what? He got up threw off the blanket and began his mission for the next 23 years of calling people to say what? La ilaha illallah. The Prophet ﷺ had one simple message for his people. Qul la ilaha illallah tuflihun. Say there is only one God but Allah and you will be successful. You will have success. This is it. And his family turned against him. His uncles ridiculed him. They threw him out. They beat him. They choked him. They threw camel guts on him. Many, many things he suffered for this cause. But let me tell you one thing right now. If I wanted to say 
The entire sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ revolves around the principle, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ I don't think there is one person who would disagree with me with evidence and I could walk off the stage and have done my job. Because that's who Muhammad ﷺ is. That's who he is to me. When I learned that, I learned who I was. I found out what I'm supposed to do with my life. Because if I say Muhammad Rasulullah, then I must live that life. And let me tell you, Wallahi, his sunnah was all about calling people to tawheed. Even down to the way he brushed his teeth. If you don't believe me, you have Shaykh Haytham, who is our resident, definite scholar. Go and ask him. Check my information. But let's go forward a little more because I gave you one story and I want to be thorough. I don't want anyone to leave this room with any doubts about this matter. Let's go forward to the worst day of the life of the greatest human being who ever walked the face of this globe, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The greatest creation Allah had ever created for mankind. The worst day of his life. What was the worst day of his life? Somebody tell me. The day of At-Ta'if. If you think you've had a bad day, go read the day of At Ta'if. And remind yourself, you've never had a bad day. The Prophet ﷺ had been not only beaten and cursed and thrown guts on and all of these things, but they kicked him and his entire family and followers, anyone who supported him, they kicked him out into the desert of Mecca to just die off. And during this time, his beloved wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, she left him and went to meet Allah. She died. And after that, his uncle Abu Talib, who even though he was not a Muslim, he was not a Muslim, probably the best non-Muslim that ever existed on the planet, ever in history. He supported the Prophet والسلام, with his wealth and with his status. No one would touch him while Abu Talib was alive, meaning they would not kill him. They would not do away with him. There was only certain things they could do because Abu Talib had his support. Then Abu Talib died as well. So the wolves of Quraysh began to circle. The wolves began to circle and the Prophet والسلام, knew that Mecca was not a safe place anymore. So he went with his adopted son Zayd. And they went to a city called At-Taif, which is a couple hour bus ride from Mecca. So you can imagine the walk in the hot desert. Walk. They walked to Taif. And for three days, according to most narrations and according to the most authentic source, for three days they spent knocking on every single door of Taif. Asking people, say, La ilaha illallah, so that you can be saved in this life and in the next. And you know what happened? Every single door was slammed in their face. Every door was slammed in his face. An entire town just turned away from him. So he sat down with the nobles of this town and he asked them for two things only. Only two things. Either accept Islam and save yourself in this life and in the next, or at least adopt me and protect me from my own people. He was at his lowest point. I'm, he's begging another town now to protect him from his own people. And what did these chiefs say to him? They laughed in his face. Laughed in his face, mocked him. Said, why did Allah have to choose you? Who were you? Why could not Allah, and Allah records it for us in the Qur'an, when they said, why could not Allah have chosen one of the chiefs of the two towns? Why couldn't He have chosen one of our chiefs, or one of the chiefs of Mecca? Why does He have to choose you? And if you are indeed a prophet, then you're too good to be sitting with us. And if you're a liar, which is what we think, then we're too good to be sitting with you. Either way, it's time for you to go. So they kicked him out. But before he left, he asked them one favor. He said, my only request to you is that you don't tell anyone that you've rejected me like this. He's been through enough. This man, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, suffered so much for human beings, for us. He said, just please don't tell anyone what you've done to me today. They announced it from the rooftops that we have rejected Muhammad and they brought the children, they brought the women, they brought the men, made them line up one after another and throw rocks and stones and bricks and whatever they could get pelting him out of town, literally running him out of town. So my, his son, his adopted son was trying to protect him. He was being beaten and battered and bloodied till the Prophet ﷺ's blood was running down his beautiful body and filling up his shoes. 
Then he got to outside of the town. He got outside of the town. And he stopped in an orchard. And he pulled out his greatest weapon. It wasn't tied around his waist. The greatest weapon that has ever been given to the believers, he pulled it out at that time. Does anybody know what it is? He put his two hands together in front of him. He raised them to the heavens. And he made supplication to his creator. The, one of the most beautiful supplications that have ever been spoken by any human being came out on that day. Such a beautiful, if you haven't read the dua of at Taif, go do it today, please. Wallahi, please go do it. Where he submitted to Allah that when you leave me like this to my enemies, for them to just ravage me. But at the end of the dua, he said, but if you are pleased with me, the light of your face is good enough to outcome all of this darkness. As long as you're pleased with me, I'm okay with whatever you do to me. At this time, and this is a little bit of a weaker of the narration, but it's relatable according to the ulama. At this time, there was the people who owned this orchard, they had a servant. And it was customary even for the Arabs, even for people who did have such a great jahiliya to, to try to help this type of person. They had something inside them, said this man needs some help, take him some food and some drink. So this servant brought some food and some drink to the Prophet ﷺ. And before taking and eating it, what did he say? He said, Bismillah. This was not something known amongst them. He said, Bismillah. But this servant had known that there was something like this. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, why did you say this? The Prophet asked him a question, said, Minayn anta? Where are you from? The man said, I'm from Ninawa. From Nineveh. From the home of Yunus alayhi salam, where Jonah was sent as a messenger. So the Prophet alayhi salatu salam said, if you're from Ninawa, then you know who I am. I am the brother of Yunus alayhi salam. I was sent with the same message that he was sent with. Say there's only one God but Allah and you'll be saved from this life and in the next. The man got down in front of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam and said to him, وَشَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ I bear witness that nothing has the right to be worshipped but Allah and you are indeed His Messenger. You see what happened, brothers and sisters, right then was the Prophet ﷺ did not guide anyone to Islam. He was only a vehicle. He didn't guide anyone. Allah opened this man's heart to accept Islam in front of the Prophet ﷺ, reminding our Rasul ﷺ on the worst day of his life, that this is why you're here. I sent you for these people. But Allah was so angry at the way his messenger had been treated. Allah was infuriated and that dua reached above the seven heavens and Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam with the angel that is in charge of all the mountains of earth and said, go to Muhammad and do whatever he wants. So Jibreel alayhi salam appeared with the angel of the mountains and said, Salamu alaykum ya Rasulullah. With me is the angel of the mountains. And the angel of the mountains according to Zayd was infuriated. He was fuming. And the only thing the angel said was, Ya Rasulullah, just give me the word. Just give me the permission. And I will take al akshadain the mountains that surround these two cities, and I will push them together and crush all of them for you. Now, for those who say Muhammad wasallam was a bloodthirsty warmonger, this statement proves everything you say to be a blatant lie. So listen up. Listen closely. If Allah had not already made it permissible for him to take revenge on these people, then these angels would not be here. Allah had already made it permissible. These people have treated you so horribly, you can deal with them. But you see, Muhammad wasallam was really sent as a rahmatul alameen, a comforter to the world. Yes, comforter, mercy to the world. He was really the epitome of the prophecy of the comforter to come from mankind. And he said to that angel, calm down, just calm down for a second. I'm not going to give you permission to do that. Now, had it been any of us, <laughs> had it been any of us, those people would be done. We're ready to kill someone if they cut us off in traffic. 
will chase them down for miles to get into a fight with him. You take my shopping cart in the, in the store, wallahi, there's going to be some drama. We would have killed them, and they would have said, there's another town over here, I got some problems with this one, and that one, we would have killed humanity in a day. If it had been us. But not for a man whose vision was, قُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ Get up and warn the people. He said, I'm not going to do this. Why? Because I hope, I sincerely wish, that maybe someone from their progeny, from their lineage, will come forward and say, La ilaha illallah. Even if one person from their lineage, even if it's a millennia from now, comes forward and says, La ilaha illallah, then what I have suffered today is worth it. You see, this is a man who cared about people more than himself. So for those who say he was a warmonging, bloodthirsty, whatever, let your lies tear you apart. Because they're lies, and lies will never go anywhere. Now, I got a question for you, a side note. How many of you are in here from the subcontinent? Raise your hand. Come on, be proud. You're proud all the other times. You're proud everywhere else. Take it up now. Bangladesh, Kashmir, Pakistan, Malaysia, and all the subcontinent. Raise your hand. Be proud. You know who you are. Does any one of you know the name of the man that took Islam to the subcontinent? One of the most populated parts of the world today for Muslims. His name was Muhammad ibn Qasim. But that's not the end of his name. What was his attribution of where he was from? His name was Muhammad ibn Qasim al-Thaqafi. Al-Thaqafi. Meaning that he hailed from one of the tribes of Ta'if. Meaning those same people the Prophet ﷺ could destroyed. Out of their lineage came a 17 year old boy named Muhammad ibn Qasim that left and went and took Islam to the subcontinent. So all of you can thank your Islam on the sincere mercy of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't grasp this. This is the connecting dots that we don't do. We don't paint this picture and realize who Muhammad really is to us sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's everything. Without him, we don't have anything. We would be lost, wandering like animals grazing, waiting to die. When you say Muhammad Rasulullah, you better think next time. Now let's go forward a little bit more because we got three more stories. Let's fast forward. Actually, I'll cut one out for time because it's not as important. We got two more. Let's fast forward a little bit more to the end of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His last year. During the last year of the life of the Prophet والسلام, after the treaty of Hudaybiyah had been signed, allowing them to make hajj, pilgrimage to the house of Allah freely. The Prophet stood on his minbar before the month of Dhul Hijjah. He said, and I ask all of you prepare for the hajj. We're gonna go and make pilgrimage to the house of Allah in Mecca. And he left with how many of his followers? This was 22 years had passed since Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. 22 years had passed since Kum fa'anthir. And how many people did he march with him to Mecca? Around 140,000 of them marched on the city of Mecca and performed the beautiful rites of Hajj. The beautiful rites of Hajj. And then this narration I'm going to tell you right now, brothers and sisters, is the most authentic a hadith that exists. If you wanted to put a hadith that was at the top, one of the most authentic, if not the most authentic, that has ever existed, with the most clean chains of narrations, in the most mutawatir of fashions, from the most companions, it's this story. But the one I'm going to tell you today is the one that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an told us, and it is narrated in the Muslim of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala alayhi. Umar said, after the day of Arafah, MashaAllah, the day of Arafah. How many of you have been to Hajj? Raise your hands. How many of you stood on that plane of Arafah? Let me tell you something about Arafah because I want to set the scene for you real quick. <laughs> MashaAllah. What is Arafah called? It's known as Yawm al-Arafah, but it also has another name. Anybody know? It's known as Yawm al-Hajj. Because Arafah is Hajj. Everything you do in Hajj, the Umrah beforehand, the marching, the walking, you're all heading towards Arafah. Why? Because you're heading for a dress rehearsal of Qiyamah. You're heading for a dress rehearsal of the day you will stand in front of Allah. 
and you feel it. Wallahi, you feel it standing there. Especially when Hajj is in the summertime. You feel it. And during Yawm al Arafah, you stand if you do it appropriately. You stand from Fajr until Maghrib. Or almost Maghrib, you start walking when the sun starts going down. And you stand there all day long doing one thing under the burning, blistering sun. You're burning. You are literally burning on that day. What are you doing? You're doing one thing all day. What are you doing? What did you do, Akhi? You made dua all day. You make dua all day long. You remember to make dua for people you've forgotten about since childhood. But there is one thing I guarantee you, every single soul that stands on the plain of Arafah makes dua for more than anything else. What did you make dua for more than anything, brother? What was the thing you made dua for most? For Allah to forgive you. You make dua, you become selfish on Arafah too. Ya Allah, forgive me. Why? Why do you do it on that day? Because the Prophet ﷺ says on the day of Arafah, Allah Azza wa Jal leaves His throne and descends to the lowest heaven in a matter that befits His majesty and honor. Not like humans ascending and descending. And He interrogates the inhabitants of the lower heaven, the angels. And He says to them, even though He has full knowledge, who are these people? Why have they gathered here? Why have they come to this place dirty, naked, tired? They look miserable. What have they come to this place for? And the angel will say, Ya Allah, they came here to require things of you, to ask you. They came here to make dua for you. And Allah will say, what did they want? What would make a person go through all of this fitna and this tribulation to stand right here under the burning sun and ask me, what do they want? What is it that they want so badly? The angels will say, Ya Allah, they want you to forgive them. They want you to forgive them their sins. And Allah will say, bear witness today all of you, that this day I have forgiven all of them, their minor sins, they're gone. You have to understand the greatness of this day. And then an angel will step forward and say, Ya Allah, there is one amongst them, he is a fasiq, he is a rebellious sinner, and he did not plan to come here today, he just happened to get here somehow. Maybe he saw everybody walking, and he decided, well if everybody's going here, well then maybe there's something here to go to. So he went. And Allah will say, bear witness that I have forgiven him too. It's the greatness of this place and this day. The Prophet ﷺ said, there's no greater day than this day. Now after this day, the Prophet ﷺ stood on Jabr al-Rahmah, which is not really a mountain, it's just a bunch of big rocks. He stood on this mountain of mercy, and he told all of his companions, come together. And I'm going to go a little bit over time, which is fine because we're going to break and we're going to take Asr. He said, all of my companions, come, come. Ta'al, I need to tell you something. And he made sure that everyone was there. And he made sure he put people in the ranks to repeat what he was saying. Repeat what I'm saying. This is why it's the most authentic narration because 140,000 people narrated this hadith. Over 140,000 heard this and we have so many chains for this same hadith. What did he say to them on that day? It became known very famously as what? The farewell sermon. The farewell sermon, the last thing he would tell this ummah as a whole. So you better listen. Wallahi, you better listen. You may have read it before, but I guarantee you, you didn't see this part. If so, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. He stood there and first, after praising Allah, he said, pay close attention to my words, for I do not know whether I will be with you again on this day after this year. He knew that his life was coming to an end because Jibreel was visiting him very regularly to check the Qur'an with him. He said, I think I'm not going to make it again back this place this year, next year. So listen to me, please, this is important. Listen! He's begging and pleading for us, listen to me! And I can't give you the whole farewell sermon, but one of the things, the mo one of the most beautiful things was he erased Asabiyyah. He said, none of you are better than anyone else. And wallahi, this is a lesson we have forgotten. We have forgotten that none of us is better than another. Except through Amal al-Salih. And no one knows whether your Amal al-Salih is accepted except Allah. So if you think you're better than someone else, then you've only repeated shaitan's arrogance in front of Allah. Then you should be ashamed of yourself. He said, pay attention to me. None of you are better than anyone else. And the words that he spoke on that day became known as the heart of the deen. This where farewell sermon is known as the heart of Islam, what Islam is all about. 
He said, Shaitan has given up on you on the big things. Beware of him in the small things. He destroyed the riba, no more usury. So many beautiful examples he gave. But in the end, he stated the most weighty statement that I believe ever came out of his mouth other than telling people about Allah. Wallahi. So this ummah, he gave us one of the most weighty commands beyond believing in Allah. At the end of the farewell sermon, he said something very beautiful. What is the last statement of the farewell sermon according to this hadith of Omar? Anybody know? Does anyone know? This is the problem. You see? This is the problem. It's a big problem. Allah is a big problem. He looked at everyone in front of him and he said, Those who are here today, convey this message to those that aren't here. Those who are here today, convey this message to those that are not here. For truly it may be that the person whom you tell the message to may understand it better than you. Wallahi, he said, tell it to those that are not here. Because the person who it's told to may understand it better than you. Do you understand what just happened, brothers and sisters? The Prophet ﷺ, for 23 years, he held a torch in his hand. And that was the torch of da'wah, conveying the message of Allah to humanity. And that torch was never given to anyone except prophets and messengers. It was first given to Nuh ﷺ, and then Jibreel retrieved it and gave it to the next, and to the next, and to the next. If you want some evidence for that, Ya Ayusha, where did you get that from? Allah says in Surah Tabayina, وَمَا عُمِرُوا إِلَى الْيَعْبُدُوا لَهَا مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ دِينَ حُنَفَا وَيُقِّمُوا الصَّلَا وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَا وَذَلِكُ الْدِينُ الْقَيِّمَةِ That the other nations before you were only commanded to worship Allah, make the deen pure for Him, establish salah, pay zakah. That was the right way for them. This is the nation, the first nation ever given the command, ud'u ila sabir rabika bil hikmati wa ma'izzat al hasana. A command, an imperative, ud'u, call into the way of your Lord. The Prophet ﷺ held that torch for 23 years, and then at the end of his mission, he handed it to this ummah. That's what made this ummah, kuntum khayrin ummatin ukhrija lin nas. You think you are the greatest nation just because you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? Allah says, "Kuntum khayrin ummatin ukhrija lin nas ta'maroon al min ma'rufi wa tanhan al anil munkar wa tu'minun billah." You are the best nation because you command to good, you forbid evil, and you believe in Allah. If you're not doing that, if we're not doing that, how dare we say we're the greatest nation? We're not doing what the Prophet ﷺ left us to do. Now, after this, so I can finish. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he pointed his fingers to the heavens and he said, O oh Allah bear witness, O oh Allah bear witness, O oh Allah bear witness, I did my job. I conveyed my message, I'm done. What you told me to do, I did it. And what did Allah respond and affirm? What verse was revealed on this moment, on this day, at this place? Anybody tell me? al this day, al yawm this day I have perfected your religion for you. Subhanallah. And I have completed my favor upon you and chosen for you Islam as your deen. Do you understand that when the Prophet handed the torch of da'wah to this ummah, Allah said, my way of life for humanity is done. It is perfected, it is completed, it was entrusted to the best of messengers, and now I have entrusted it to the best nation that I have ever created for humanity. Do we grasp that? Do we realize that da'wah is what makes us who we are? Without it, we are nothing. You cannot say Muhammad Rasulullah and you're not out doing what he did. Every day he lived his life trying to share Islam with the world. So if you get up and brush your teeth with a miswak and pull your thobe up and wear a beard and put on a hijab and pray sunnan and you think you're following the Messenger of Allah, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling only one person, that's you. I would rather you leave all of that off and go out and do the job of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi, I would. Because if we don't do it, we're going to be disgraced forever. When we lost da'wah, we lost everything. We lost our izzah, our authority, our honor, everything, our shame, it's all gone. And we can only get it back by coming back to Allah and doing the job that was left to us. Now, let me finish with the last two minutes. The last story, and this is Wallahi. If this is not the saddest story to every single Muslim in this room, your iman needs to be checked. Nine 
approximately nine months later, the Prophet ﷺ was sick. He was sick. And he was laying his head on the woman whom he loved the most in this life. He was laying his head on the woman whom he loved the most in this life. And their love story is the most beautiful love story. That's why people try to destroy it. When Aisha, when, when, when a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, who do you love most? He said, Aisha. He said, no, 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 amongst men. He wanted some love from the Prophet ﷺ. What did the Prophet, peace be upon him, say? He didn't say Abu Bakr, nah. He said Abuha, her father. He still talked about her. That's love. He said, I don't love Abu Bakr, I love her father after I love her. Because why? Because he's her father. Get it straight, brothers. Now, he was laying his head on her chest and he was dying. And she asked for the miswak. And I mean, he asked for the miswak and she softened it and he tasted her saliva last, as Brother Riyadh said. And Jibreel came into the room, asked for his permission to take his soul. As you have heard, one of the things that was so beautiful to me was that before taking his soul, the Prophet ﷺ said, every messenger before Allah takes his soul, Allah shows them their place in Jannah. So Aisha said she saw the Prophet looking up at the ceiling. He was looking at his home in Jannah and he was being offered, do you want to go there or do you want to stay here? Wallahi, it was an easy choice for him. The last words that ever came out of our Prophet ﷺ's mouth after saying, as salah after salah, as salah, he said, Allahumma rafiq al-ala. O oh Allah, the companion of Most High. And Aisha radiallahu anha said, I knew that at that, that moment, the angel of death was in the room and he wasn't choosing us. So he died sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But one thing I will tell you, that was the most horrible day for all the companions and still the most horrible day for us. But there was something about them that we don't use as an example. They understood that yes, maybe the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is dead. Maybe he's gone. But if we continue to do our job, the deen of Allah will live. The kalam of Allah will live. If we do the job that was left to us nine months ago. And we have to say one thing and I finish with this. We have to say, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen for those companions. Anyone who insults the companions, he has no deen. Wallahi, you insult one single companion, you have no Islam. Because if they did what we do, if they sat on their behinds every day and did what we do, I guarantee you, it's a almost surety that not many of you would be Muslim today. If they did what we do. Islam may have never been known and eradicated from the world. So we have to say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen for their success and their striving and their efforts. Maybe they had faults, but guess what? They were better than all of us because they did their job. We got to do our job. So let's get to work and let's remember Muhammad Rasulullah means something. It's not just words. Wa jazakru khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.